Father, as we come to you now, those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ anticipate his coming. For us, it is a day of deliverance. It is a rescue just like when Israel was removed from the land of Egypt. It is a time to be ushered into the presence of our God. And Father, it is a time for us to leave this godless world I'm reminded of the words of the writer of Hebrews concerning those who suffered for the faith. And the scripture says, of whom the world was not worthy. In that expression, we do not see that we as individuals are better than the lost. We see that this godless world does not satisfy us. And we will never be satisfied here because our heart and our home are in heaven. May the Spirit of God teach us today. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Let's take a few moments, and I'll take questions if you have them. Looking at your outlines, I'm going to contrast two things, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. Please, in your notes, if this confuses you, write, begin together. That's what you need to remember. Begin together. They start at the same time. The day of the rapture, or the day of Christ, is actually the beginning of a period of time. This, the day of Christ, is a point. The day of, the, of Jehovah, or the day of the Lord, is a process. It includes a number of things. It includes the tribulation, there are seven years. It includes the millennium. It includes the great white throne judgment. And it includes the new heavens and the new earth. No, there are no notes on this. So I'll repeat it. All right? The day of the Lord includes four things as far as a, please, listen how I say this as far as a calendar chronology. But it's really not a term about time. For example, we live in the day of grace. You know that's not a day, it is a period. And the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath is a, a period of time. And it includes judgment. The one thing that is always true when this term is used, Day of Jehovah, on the right, it's always judgment. So, let me remind you, and we'll go down this chart, but the Day of the Lord is not something important to us. It is important to history. It is important to the unsaved. It is important to this godless world. Okay? Separate it that way. Now, it includes four things, and I'll list them again. It includes a seven-year tribulation. It includes a 1,000-year millennium. It includes the... Uh, great white throne judgment and then I'm going to state this this way it includes the destruction of this present world system for that last phrase that I just gave you you might write 1 Peter 3 and you can look at it later but Peter tells us that the age will end with the destruction by fire of this heavens and this earth as we know it. I said 1 Peter, 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3, beginning at verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. You see, it comes in, and that's why this is important. They both start at the same time, like the day of the wedding, and it could be the day that you get pregnant but they're two different things. So it comes in with that, 
and it ends with the heavens passed away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The entire period. Now, here's the differences to lay some groundwork and the next chart will actually help also. The day of Christ, Jesus does not come to the earth. He only comes in the air to take the church to heaven. Rapturo, to remove. The day of Jehovah, He comes to the earth with the church. When He comes to the earth, it is after the tribulation, before the millennium. Look at 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 1. Let's begin reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. We're going to come to verse 8 in a moment. Paul says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Two things characterize the believer there. Number one, their faith is always increasing as believers. And number two, their love for other believers is increasing. So that, verse 4, we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience or endurance is our idea and faith in all persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence. Pause for a moment. People make professions of faith and have no intention of suffering for Christ. Paul just told us the proof that I'm a believer is I'm willing to suffer persecution for the faith. That doesn't mean I'm looking forward to being burned at the stake. But it does mean I expect I'm going to be mistreated and resented and rejected. I understand that. Verse number nine, uh, no, sorry, five, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God yet to come. You see, he is not saying they're in the kingdom, they're going to the kingdom for which you also suffer since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Did you hear what he just said? The tribulation is for those who hate God. It is not for those who love God. Suffering tribulations, yes, but not the tribulation. And to give you who are troubled rest with us. We're in verse 7. And to give you who are troubled rest with us. Now listen carefully to what it says. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the second coming. That is after the tribulation. That is just before the millennium. That's a clear distinction between the rapture in the air when he takes the church out and his return to the earth and it's with the church. Someone says, well, these verses don't say that. Revelation 19 does. There are other passages, but Revelation 19 comes immediately to mind when we come with him to the earth. Am I clear or unclear? Clear. Go ahead. Clear, but okay, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14, it says, when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. That is the second coming. No. Oh, wait a minute. Say that. Read the verse again. When Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. No, that is the rapture. I thought the rapture, he was taking everybody up to him. Wait a minute, you're reading one verse, one of the rules of Bible, in context. 
Why are they coming back? Look at verse 16. Where, where are they? Oh, at first, first Thessalonians 4, 16, the very passage she's in. Okay. We who are alive on the earth will not, what? Will not meet him ahead of those who have died. That's right. But then it goes on to say the ones who have died will go first and then will. They've been in heaven. Now let's stop for a moment. Let's stop for a moment. This is where we have to think, okay? Back up. Where is Paul right now? In heaven. Right now? Mm -hmm. In heaven. So when he gets his body, a body is a part of this physical world. Right. So he's coming back to get his body. Oh. So he is returning. We, if we're alive, are raptured. But, okay, so he, his soul is returning to get his body, but those people that are returning to get their body are going to go up first. We all go together. Oh. Well, it's it a says, unit. Think of it this way. I'm giving you a moment to read so that yeah. I can get your mind. The church is like a pearl, Jesus said. Of all of the gems, you cannot split a pearl. Okay. It is one unit. It is neither Old Testament Jew, nor is it tribulation saint. It is only between Pentecost and the rapture. Everybody saved in that period, Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female, every one of them is a Christian and all of the Christians leave as a group. However, the starting of that process includes in a moment, in the second. Paul says it's in the twinkling of an eye. Do you know what the twinkling of an eye is? Quickly. <laughs> it's one twentieth of a blink. Okay. So in other words, it's so fast, it's over before it gets started. But here's what it says. The Bible says they return they get their bodies. We go up, all of us together, and it's that quick. They get their bodies for us. Yes, but it, it says, uh, first the Christians who have died will rise from their graves, then to, together with them. We are right. still alive. They okay, so it is simultaneous. Yes, it is together. Okay, is that clear? Right. Uh, what confused me was the first part about bringing back the believers who have died. So that's the, he's, their think souls of, are coming think back. Of, <laughs> yes, well, the problem is we use the word soul so much mm -hmm. it gets muddied. Mm -hmm. God breathed into Adam's nostrils his body, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Mm -hmm. A soul has a spirit and a body. So spirit would be the better word. Yes. And I don't want to be technically true, but there's, if you read the whole Bible through, and, and this never got clarified, we have all kinds of places that things are moved around. And you say, why did God do it that way? Let me ask you a question. When you first started learning math, how many of you began with trigonometry? <laughs> oh, didn't everybody? <laughs> In other words, you have to grow in understanding. And God purposely did that because here's what we know. A true believer will keep digging. Yes. A non-believer will lose interest very yes. quickly. Yeah. So that's why it's that way. It's not intended to make it hard. It's intended that the process itself cleanses the visible church on earth and separates the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats, if I can use that term, which is not really a good term for the church. Does that answer that question? Yes, but what I don't understand is why there aren't many more people like you who are being sought out to answer the questions. I can answer that question. Um, the question is why there isn't more interest in the Bible. That's really what you're saying, so that there is a greater need for Bible teaching. 
And I have watched this for 50 years. I didn't just start. When I started, the first church that I pastored grew, in, I would say, in a brief period of time, literally to a thousand. But the truth of the matter is, the church is so different today from then because the culture is much more much in greater contrast. I can't figure how to use the word different and make that come out right. The, the, the culture hates God. So we're dealing with an anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible culture. And I would say that what I do, if I preached, well, no, because I can preach that way, but the average church today does not consistently want doctrine. The church today wants scratch me where I itch. That's just the culture. You know, this isn't, here, here's the term you'll use. Oh, we'll hear. That isn't relevant. Mm -hmm. There's no truth that is irrelevant unless God is irrelevant. It's just I don't know how to get to it and where to put it, how to apply it. That's the problem. But not it is irrelevant. So the answer to your question is this. The church is in a state of decline. Not just numerically, but doctrinally. Mm -hmm. It has been in that state. And Jesus said it would be that way all through church history, Matthew 13. Jude, the last book of the New Testament before the book of Revelation, is purely about how bad there is this decline. So the answer to your question is the cause of the problem is the spiritual state of the nation and the church today is one of not really that interesting. So, does that answer? Mm -hmm. All right, then let's come back and notice, if you will, let me walk down the day of Christ. And if I can use this term, this period of time here is a brief period of time that goes in to the future of the church, that is a long period of time that covers the earth. So, the day of Christ, he comes in the air to take us to heaven. The term is a term of merciful deliverance. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the term us. That is a reference to the Christians. God has not called the believer to ever face wrath. We will never, never, ever face wrath. It's not even in our future. Wrath is a historical word for us. It's never future. So the term day of Christ is a merciful term. It's for the church. And it takes us to the Bema seat of Christ for rewards. Do any of you know what the term Bema comes from? If I put judgment seat of Christ, the term itself conveys the idea of judgment but not judgment in the sense of punishment, judgment in the sense of discernment. Take your Bible, hold your place here. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 for a moment. 1 Corinthians 3, hold your place in Thessalonians. We do plan to come back. But 1 Corinthians 3, Paul describes the Bema Seed of Christ. Notice, if you will, let us begin reading at verse number 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of our hope of heaven, of our salvation, is Jesus Christ. Not our faith, not our obedience, not our service, Jesus Christ. Now, listen carefully. Now he talks about the Christian life and he uses the image of building. 
Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. Pause. What is the difference between wood, hay, straw, and gold, silver, precious stones? They're two different groups. What is the difference? One gets destroyed in fire, and the other doesn't. One gets destroyed, one isn't, but here's what's also true. Anyone else have something to contribute? Let me ask you a question. How long does it take to grow straw? To grow seed? Mm -hmm. Not well, long. One season. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long does it take to grow trees? 20, 30, 40, 50, 75 years. Wood, hay, straw. These things come up very quickly. And they're destroyed very quickly. What's the difference with gold, silver, and precious stones? Number one, they're not visible. These things are visible. These are not. Secondly, gold, silver, and precious stones are produced in the darkness by the pressure of God. And they are valuable. In other words, Paul says there's two kinds of, notice the word he uses. Look, if you will, please, at verse number 12. I'm Yes, verse number 13, pardon me. Everyone's, would you underline the next word in your Bible? I'm going to ask you, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 3, 13, what's that next word? Work. What's the difference between work and works? Singular versus plural. He's not concerned about how much. He's concerned about the quality of what's there. Is it wood, hay, straw, or stubble? Or is it gold, silver, precious stones? Because this I can produce. I would say this to you, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but it's the truth. My most successful ministry was my greatest failure in ministry. Really? Mm -hmm. Because I was taught when I went to Bible college and to seminary methods to get the job done. And I exercised the methods successfully. I had in the first year that I was a pastor, personally led 123 people to Christ. Now, are you ready for this? One year later, they were all listed in the back of my Bible. One year later, 21 of them were in church. And I had to ask the question, how much of my work mm -hmm. was wood, hay, and stubble? Was it real? Gold, silver, and precious stones are always real. <clears throat> and God does something in us and through us and in other people and he does the work. So look carefully what it says here. Everyone's work will become clear, or some translations read will be manifest for the day. And notice the word day is capitalized. Why did the translators translate it day in capitals? Do you, does your Bible have it capitalized? Yes. What verse is that? Verse 13. Judgment day. Does it say judgment day? Mm -hmm. Well, that's theologically right, but is it capitalized? Okay. The reason the translators of the New King James made it capital is because they understood the theology. It's the day of Christ. This is all part of the day of Christ, the judgment or bema seat of Christ. That's what this is focusing on. It is a focusing on our sin that is not even going to come up. Verse 13, everyone's service, everyone's ministry, everyone's labor, everyone's work will become clear. For the day will declare it 
because it will be revealed by fire. What fire is it talking about? Let me ask you to write down a verse in the margin of your Bible or your notes. Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter number 1, when we see Jesus Christ at this judgment, Revelation 1 describes the Christ that we see with these words. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Revelation 1.14. So what's going to happen? Christ is going to look at my ministry, my life, my service, and He's going to say, Tom, your motive here was not right. This wasn't for God. This was for ego. This was for flesh. This was for self. That is wood, hay, and stubble. I worked in your heart to get this. Gold, silver, precious stones. A lot of things that have been done in the name of Christianity have not been for God. His concern is motivation. And He works in us to produce right motives. That's why gold, silver, and precious stone. Pressure from God. Now listen carefully to what it says. For the day will declare it because it will, the fire will test each one's work of what kind. Notice that. The fire is not testing the volume. It's only testing the kind. What word do you have in your Bible? My Bible reads sort, but the word is normally translated in the King James, kind. Are you still in Revelation? Yeah. Well, no. Us. No. I'm in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 3. Mine okay. says the kind of Verse 13. Okay. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. Uh, for each one, for what each one has done. What sort of work each one has done. Sort? Yeah. Kind is the best translation. Yeah. I lost my place. Where are we? First Corinthians 3, 13. 13. Melanie, your Bible. Uh, every man's work shall be made. Sort. And Diane? Quality. Okay. Quality is a good word. So it's the quality of it, not the quantity of it. And the quality is, is it divinely called? Is it divinely inspired? Is it divinely blessed? Is God really doing this? Or are we helping God out? Because here's the difference. Wood, hay, and stubble means our concern is short term. What's the benefit in the next year, the next five years, the next ten years? What's the benefit in darkness for a long period of time before it's ever brought to light? Now notice what it says. Continuing in verse 14. If anyone's work, again, singular, if anyone's ministry, service, labor, work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. What? What does your Bible read? Does it all read so as through fire? That is the end of verse uh, 15. I'm sorry, Melanie? So as by fire. So as by fire? Mine says through a wall of flames. Through a wall of flames. Good translation. Is that what ESV? Only as through fire. Okay. Let me illustrate what it's talking about. He is using a metaphor. He is using a picture. But he's teaching a literal truth. And what is the literal truth? Have any of you ever been in a house on fire? Yes. No. Okay. If you find out that the fire is burning and you want your life to be saved, you may run out and not grab anything. 
So it's all gone. There is nothing you have but yourself. He Himself will be saved as though He had run from a fire. In other words, there will be some people who have no reward at all. It doesn't matter what people thought. God says in the final analysis, you have nothing because your motive was wrong. So, why the term Bema? Because in the days of the New Testament, when they had the races, at the end of the race, the runner who won would be given a crown. It was never a gold crown. What he was given was called a Bema, and the Bema was nothing more than a crown of leaves, and you've seen them in, in, in Greek and Roman history. In other words, the idea is you are rewarded, but not rewarded in such a way that you've got something you're carrying above everybody else, and you're on some kind of an ego trip. You are honored for your faithfulness. Now, are there any questions? Because we're not spending our time the rest of the day on that. We're all comfortable with that. I didn't say we like everything we just read, because what it means, if you really understand, you start to look back over your life, over your service, and you say to yourself, well, I thought I was doing good there, and maybe after today I'm not doing so good. <laughs> but it's in the Scripture for our admonition. It's to help us to keep perspective. And for me, I come from a background that the most important thing was numbers. I was trained. It's almost like you have to succeed in business. And I mean I was trained that way all the way through college and seminary. And I came out with that mindset and it took me 10 years out of seminary to finally realize, wait a minute, I'm a successful churchman, but I'm not necessarily a successful pastor. And probably I was 20 years in the ministry and settled down. In my mind, I look back to a specific time period when I moved to Central Bible Church here in Florida. That is the first time that I had my head screwed on right. Because I was no longer interested in the business. I was interested in, what do you want done here, God? What do you want me to do? What is my role that you want? And that became a turning point in my life and ministry. And I would say this, I had a lot of headaches when I was young because when you deal with people, even if you call pastoring church, there's some ways that pastoring is like running Dillard's department store. There's things that go on. And over here, that became a problem. Over here, you realize, you know what? If God told me this is what He wants, and they don't want it, I know one thing. they got a problem with God. Whether they're saved or lost, carnal or spiritual, that's God's problem. And I totally changed my view of how people work. So, coming back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we left off at verse 9. The church is saved from wrath. We go through no wrath. The day of Jehovah, Jesus Christ comes to the earth. That is truly, and you might want to write this, that is the second coming. That is the only thing that is the second coming, the right column at the top. The day of Jehovah, this is the second coming. There are seven years between the rapture and the second coming. But the rapture kicks this whole process into being. Because the tribulation is part of the day of Jehovah. So both began as a thief in the night when the church is removed and now seven years of tribulation. After the tribulation, Jesus comes to earth with the church in righteous wrath and he judges Israel and the nations. And I would write down in your Bibles, Matthew 25, verses 41 and following. This is where he separates the sheep from the goats to enter the kingdom. 
Now go back to Matthew chapter 24 for a moment. Let's clarify Matthew 24. This is where who is taken in Matthew 24 becomes clearer now. Matthew 24, notice if you will, Matthew 24 beginning at verse 38, Jesus speaks of his second coming, and by the way, this will help you forever. If you would write over Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, one word over both chapters, Jewish. Jewish. This is not about the church. The church is nowhere in either of these chapters. This is all Jewish prophecy, and he's answering a Jewish question at a Jewish temple to a Jewish group of believers who think the kingdom should be starting. Verse 38. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my Father only. As, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. We know what went on in the days of Noah. It was a morally wrecked world. And that's what he says. He says, for as in the days of Noah before the flood, they're eating and drinking, marrying and giving in the marriage act, which is sensuality, until the day the Lord, uh, pardon me, until the day that Noah entered the ark. Pause. Noah, what was his relationship to the flood? Was Noah destroyed? No. Lived through the flood. Came out of the flood. But notice, if you will, verse 39, those people did not know until the flood came and took them all away. They were taken away in judgment. And in this judgment, God is going to take all of the unsaved off of the earth. And the only people on the earth, day one of the millennium, is going to be the Christians from the church age, the believers from the Old Testament, and the people who are saved in the tribulation. And they're going to march into the millennium. And let me stop and clarify something else. The world is going to be repopulated. Where are those babies going to come from? Everybody can't have a glorified body. The people coming out of the tribulation who are saved enter the millennium with their natural body. And they have children. And their children have children. And the world will be repopulated. There's a reason for this in the plan of God. Are there any questions about that? Wait. Who's populating the millennial kingdom? You said the believers in the tribulation. And who? You mentioned the Old Testament saints? No. They okay. have glorified bodies. Okay. They have glorified bodies. Yeah. And their body is glorified right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. We went to heaven. We came back with Christ. And now he gives Paul his, I'm sorry, he gives Moses his body. Okay. Up till this point, Moses didn't have it. I know I'm being technical and someone says, why is it important? It's important because God said it's important. That's the only reason it's important. But here's why it's important. Old Testament saints, in the plan that God had for the church, they are not part of it. The church has a special place in the purpose of God. That doesn't mean the church is better. It's held distinct from Old Testament saints, from tribulation saints, and there will be people saved in the millennium. They are not part of the church. They are believers. They enjoy heaven. There's nothing different there. The church is the bride of Christ held in special place because God said so. All right. Let's build on this for a moment. 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians have two different focuses. Am I okay here? 1 yep. Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians have two different focuses. Notice 1 Thessalonians, he comes in the air to take his bride away. Okay. He ends the present age of grace, or more properly, the church age, because God has been gracious in all ages, 
but we sometimes refer to the church age as the age of grace. In 1 Thessalonians, the Spirit of God is working in the church. And then Paul wrote this book of 1 Thessalonians to remind them of what he taught when he was there. Now, build a wall. Paul introduced the day of the Lord, the second coming in chapter 5. We're going to look at it in a moment. But in 2 Thessalonians, he comes to bring the kingdom to earth. He brings the future day of the Lord, day of just judgment. In the tribulation, Satan is working in the world. He is given free reign because the church indwelt by the Spirit of God has been removed in the tribulation. And then, I don't know about that word repsond. I think it's respond. <laughs> it's it's uh, second Thessalonians. Greek. It's what? Oh, Greek. Greek. It's Greek. I mean, he responds to false teaching. See, let me explain to you, and we'll see this in a minute. But in Second Thessalonians, they thought the rapture occurred already. They thought they had been left behind. And someone told them they misunderstood Paul. And there was even a letter written that they said was by the hand of Paul, which wasn't by his hand. So he writes 2 Thessalonians to tell us the church is not included. Here's what to expect. And then we're going to look at that in just very few moments. Here's the difference between the rapture and the second coming or it's called the revelation. The purpose of the rapture is to reward his saints. We go to the Bema seat of Christ in the air. We are taken out. There are no signs. People talk about the signs of the end times. All the signs in the Bible are to Israel, not to the church. We don't even have one. There's not one. What's going on in the Mideast is not for us. What's going on in world governments? Not us. What's going on in America? Not us. Those are not signs. Oh, Jesus said and Paul said that we can pick the season up, but they are not signs. In other words, it is April and all of a sudden you see the trees starting to bud. All of a sudden, you have the crocuses and the tulips and the daffodils coming out of the ground. They're a hint. Spring's coming. That's what we're seeing. But they are not signs. A sign is a divine revelation. This is a mystery. And only believers are affected here. The world is not. Once we're gone, it'll be total chaos by our absence. The revelation, the second coming, after the tribulation, before the tribulation, after the tribulation, that little line is seven years of time. After the tribulation, you have Jesus returning to believing or elect Jews. When you read in Matthew 24 that the angels gather God's elect, the elect in Matthew are the Jews, the believers. Secondly, Jesus sits on the throne of His glory on earth, not the great white throne in heaven. Revelation 20, they are not the same. There are many signs, 320 in fact signs, of the second coming. And the entire world and all nations are affected. Is that understandable? I didn't ask you if you were going to be a theologian on the subject. Do you understand big difference and the tribulation in between the two. Is that clear in your mind? Not do you fully understand it, but do you understand that's what Tom Couch just said. Yeah. I see a question in your mind. Are you okay? No. You're overwhelmed. When you said many signs and prophecies, well, first of all, you said the signs of the end times discussed in the Bible are in regard to Israel. Mm-hmm. So what are you which signs and prophecies are you talking about there? Well, uh, Matthew chapter 24, the, 
Which signs are we talking about? I'll give you some signs. Matthew 24, the fig tree budded. The fig tree is a picture of Israel. Israel became a nation in 1948. That's before this, but it's a sign for this. Israel fought 14 wars, if my memory is correct, since they became a nation. It was not until 1972, 73, no it wasn't, 67, it was the 1967 war that they finally gained Jerusalem. That was another sign because Jerusalem is the capital during the tribulation. So you're talking about the signs for, the, for Israel? That's all Israel. Okay. There's no sign for you and for me. And all the guys that are preaching that there are signs right now, what bugs me is the church should not be looking for signs. Yeah. We should be listening for a sound. That's all we get. And this is the sound of a trumpet. No warning. So, now is that clear? Mm -hmm. We got that. Okay. No other questions? I have a question. The, t the term that he will come as a thief in the night. How is that possible if they're going through the tribulation period? Well, then they don't know it's the tribulation period. So that is it? correct. So they're not aware of his second coming. That is correct. Gotcha. Okay. That's the meaning of the term there. Yeah. He comes both times in the air as a thief in the night. Nobody knows what's going on. And even when he returns to the earth, he comes as a thief in the night. But the point is that the period the tribulation period is also part of that thief in the night because when the church is raptured and the tribulation begins, the whole world does not know what has happened. Yes, yes. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we are gone tomorrow and the news people begin to collect what they can of what's going on and you'll hear something like this said, aliens came and took them. Yeah. Because they have no explanation. They're not going to go to the Bible and say, what did God do? Oh, he took all the believers out. <laughs> They're not going to have any idea of what's going on. Do you think anybody on. is going to realize what happened? Yeah. They're not going to understand what happened. They'll know when they come to my condo, if I'm living here, and that condo is empty. They haven't seen me perhaps for 48, 72 hours. And somebody says, I think I'm going to go check. I haven't seen the couches. They knock on the door and there's an answer. They must have left town. No, wait a minute. There are cars here. Now, wait a minute. All the people that Red left behind, they're driving down the road, and all of a sudden, cars are empty. They're not going to realize that that was the... Well, now you're asking me to give you a theological question to a practical problem. They don't see it in the twinkling of an eye. No, I know, but they're going to be driving down the road, and all of a sudden there's going to be cars beside them, behind them. They have nobody in them. Mm -hmm. They're not going they're to not realize going to what happened. Do you really think they're going to grab a Bible verse and <laughs> no, say? But if they left, if they read left behind. Well, some people have read the Bible that haven't been saved. So they I'm not may not. Everybody. So they. My point is, so they may suspicion. They just don't know. Okay. But there will be people that will become believers during the tribulation. Right. I know. I know. Yeah. And I do believe that the greatest number of people saved in world history, in history, will be during the tribulation wow. period. It will be the greatest revival the world has ever known. It will also be the greatest slaughter because the truth of the matter is, as Christians are saved in the tribulation period, in the midst of all that chaos, you can rest assured the governments of the world trying to take control and produce order are going to be anti-God because that's what the Bible says. So they are going to be anti-Christian, although that term, we use it, they're going to see them as religious and they will be anti-religious or they will be omni-religious and these radicals are a problem. Okay, it seems to me that anybody that hasn't accepted Christ before the tribulation, then all these terrible things are going to start happening. It's hard to believe that more people are going to become Christians because they're wanting, most people want to go with the flow. They want to do what's easy. 
You know, if somebody wants to take over the country and tell them now you can't do this, it's hard to believe that that many people will fight against them for God. Let me ask you a very simple question. It's hard to believe people will be saved in mass because they want to go with the flow. Right. Let's put you on a plane. Yes. And the plane is going down. And you are a Christian. I wonder how many people on that plane are going to pray who have never prayed before. I wonder how many people on that plane are going to think back of all of the truths that they have heard and been taught that they never accepted. You better think quick. I agree in that case. <laughs> but I'm but, saying the people that are left. That's what I'm saying. Those that are in the well, plane are going down. Well, I mean after that. After the rapture has occurred and the planes have crashed and the cars are empty and People go to the grocery store and there's no grocery store because that person's gone. And I just or they go to the grocery store and find out. Revelation chapter 6. A loaf of bread. A loaf of bread costs an entire day's wages. That's the economics of that period. In desperation, where do people turn? God. That's the key to what's going on. Well, I mean, if the Bible says it's true, that's the that's And the I truth. don't think you doubt it. It's hard to comprehend it, but we're not doubting it. Desperation, right. Right. desperation is God's greatest mm -hmm. altar call. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it's what that, pardon? The is the fox holes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the point is that that period of time is going to cause people to sense a need of God. Now, I agree that humanity will start, and at first, till the dust settles and the world gets reoriented, you're going to have a lot of explanations, a lot of anti-God and atheistic and agnostic, think, agnostic thinking. But when the dust finally settles, there are going to be unanswered questions unexplained mysteries. And I have no doubt that there will be people who rejected the rapture that weren't saved, that all of a sudden after the rapture are going to start to say, maybe. Yeah. So it will unfold in its own way. It's, it was the same way when Jesus came the first time. Think this through. The Jews were the greatest enemy of Christianity. They are still enemies of Christianity, and that's why God raised them up. God had every intention in the Old Testament to show them as rebels. He has every intention in the church age to show them as rejecting Christ, and then turn around and in the tribulation period bring them to Christ. A nation will be born in a day. They'll look upon him whom they have pierced. And the Bible tells us the nation will grieve we. All right. Let's go to the next slide. And now we're going to walk through 1 Thessalonians 5. I want you to see the contrast. Because this chapter is a contrast between the Christians and non-Christians. But concerning the times and the seasons, and I told you before, that's a prophetic term from the Bible, from the Old Testament. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, um, you have no need that I should write you. I don't need to go over that. Now, I want you to underline a contrast. The contrast in verse 2 and following. It's going to first of all be you and they. Verse 2, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord ushers in as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Verse 4. 
But you, brethren, are not in spiritual darkness, so that this day should overrun you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor darkness. Do you see the contrast? Saved and unsaved. Now notice, if you will, he continues in verse 6. Therefore, and now it's us and those. Same idea, but different uh, uh, noun use. Therefore, let us not sleep. And sleep means slumber at what's going on. Therefore, let us not slumber as others do, but let us watch and be alert, sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk all night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. He said, what is our hope at this time? He just told us the answer. It's what we anchor our mind to. Notice, if you will, he tells us the key to staying level-headed and not running around like a chicken with its head cut off is we grab our faith, we love the brethren, and notice verse 8, the hope of salvation from this judgment to come. Verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. What do you think when you hear that Christians will never face the wrath of God? We leave. Never. Never. It's, 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 it's over. Someone says, well, that means I get to live for the devil. Not if you're a Christian. You don't want to do that. A true Christian doesn't want that. A true Christian is so grateful for the grace of God that they want to live for Him or struggle toward living for Him. Notice, if you will, verse 9, continuing. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we are alive or we're deceased, wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Now, looking at the screen, Paul contrasts four things in this chapter. Our knowledge, their ignorance. Why do we get upset when the world looks at climate change and says we'll solve the problem by simply producing some laws that eliminate the use of coal? Do you know what they're telling me? They don't understand we're getting ready for what the Bible says in Revelation 7 and Revelation 9, the tribulation. The world is changing. But the reason it's changing is not what they're saying. It's because God is getting this world ready. And it is only just begun. It is going to get far, far worse. Our expectancy of Christ and then the tribulation, they are totally caught by surprise, verse 3. We are sober, level-headed, and they are drunk. When you see drunkenness, he's not just thinking of them drinking alcohol, though alcohol consumption has reached records it's never reached in my lifetime in recent years. But here's the point. What is true of a drunk? He is not conscious fully of all that's going on. That's the point. They are like drunkards who are totally out of it. And then our salvation and their judgment is what he's contrasting. All right? Now let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul is writing to comfort the church because somewhere word has come out that Paul said the church will go through the tribulation. 
Now, listen carefully. Marv Rosenthal and Midrath Rapture, Robert Gundry and post-trib rapturists, post-millennialists, which Southern Baptists started as, and I grew up as, although I wasn't taught post-millennialism, I was taught why our church had moved from that, but nonetheless, post-millennialists, all of these groups see the church going through the tribulation. Some say the church is raptured halfway through it, five and a half years through it, at the end of it, or even after the millennium. Although they are all wrong, here's the point. Paul wrote this chapter and he said, I want you to understand, the church is not going to go through any of it. Let's get that clear, Paul said. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's begin reading. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to Him, that is the rapture, we ask you to not, pardon me, not to be soon shaken in your mind or troubled either by spirit catching that mood or by word, somehow a record of Paul's statements have been misused, or letters. So there was a letter between 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And somebody said Paul wrote it, and it says that the church will go through the tribulation period. That is the only explanation you can have by this being written after this was written. They don't harmonize. So Paul wants to clarify. Don't be shaken, so soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says there are five things that have to happen and they are part of the day of the Lord. So looking at your final, I believe this is your final um, Final love. Screen. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Slide. So, what has to happen before the day of the Lord ends? Not when does it start? Because remember, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord start together. Same period of time. It's ushered in like a thief in the night. So, what do we expect? Verse number three. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. Underline that, will not come. Unless, notice if you will, verse 3, the falling away comes first. I want to stop. The word falling away, there are two words used in the New Testament in the translations. How many of you have falling away? What translation? Uh, King James. Okay. What do you have? Apostasy. Apostasy. What are we in again? Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three. Mine doesn't read like that. Huh? What does it read? Yes. Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there's a great rebellion against God. So rebellion is your word. Yeah, rebellion. We have falling away, apostasy, rebellion. Now, let me explain something to you. If I am a believer and I turn from the faith, in the Greek language, the word to stand for Christ is the word S-T-A-S-I-S, stasis. We get our word static from it. When I take a step back, that word in the original language is apo, apostasis. That is the word used when you back off. So when a person turns from the faith, listen how I say this, they can only turn from the faith once they claim to be in the faith. People who reject the faith cannot be guilty of this. So as the Lord is getting ready to return, you see exactly what you see going on in America. 
Why is it that there's such lack of interest in God, church? First, we heard 10 or 15 years ago a battle against Christmas. Now it's against conservatism and all Christianity. I'm not surprised. God said that the world, here's why. Please listen to how I say this, it's important. The world is getting ready for an antichrist. That is exactly what's going on. And the Antichrist, I don't mean this unkind. I don't think it will be. And there are many reasons I don't. But just for the sake of discussion, it could be uh, Joe Biden. It could be Donald Trump. I'm sorry for all of you Donald Trumpites out there. We don't know who it is, except I can tell you this. He has to come from the old Greek empire, Daniel 8. So technically on that, I would argue he can't be American unless he's got blood back to that. Other than that, doesn't fit. That being said, what has to happen? Verse 1, the church has to be removed. That's the rapture. You have the church on earth, and when the church is taken away, the falling away and the taking of the church are all part of the same event as it comes to its culmination. Secondly, notice, if you will, the Bible says in verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come to full fruition unless the falling away come first and the man of sin is revealed. The second thing, the man of sin the lawless one, or you know him generally as the Antichrist. The Antichrist has to come. Now stop. I want you to listen to this. You have to read the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, when is the Antichrist introduced? He is not introduced in his fullness until the middle of the tribulation. That's why you will have theologians speak of the first three and a half years as the tribulation and the second three and a half years as the great tribulation. Because in Revelation chapter number 11, you have a turning point. And then in Revelation 13, he is fully, blocked, fully revealed. So what happens? In the first three and a half years, he will come on the scene and he will come on a this is the image. This is not necessarily literal, though it could be literal. I wouldn't argue that. He comes on a white charger. And as a white charger, that was a sign of victory all through history. So he comes triumphant in power, and he carries two things. He carries a bow, but no arrow, which means he conveys to the world he's a man of peace. And that's the first three and a half years. He's uniting the world. The last three and a half years, he's going to turn on the nation of Israel and lead the whole world against Israel. That is from Revelation chapter 16 to the end of Revelation chapter 19. Notice, if you will, the third thing. The temple has to be rebuilt. Now, I can only assume, let's read the, the, the chapter and see why I'm saying that. Verse 4 who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God. So he has, there has to be a temple. There are a lot of factors about this I don't know, but I can tell you a couple of things. Number one, the temple has to be rebuilt during the first three and a half years. I think, based upon what the scripture teaches, Daniel chapter number nine when the tribulation begins, it is not going to begin because of the rapture. The technical beginning is going to be when the Antichrist signs a conditional covenant with the nation of Israel, allowing them to build a temple. And that's what Daniel chapter 9 says. So he, they will rebuild the temple, and he then will one day, according to this, which is in the middle, of the tribulation, the abomination of desolation, Matthew 24, Daniel 9, Revelation chapter 11, and following, he will then sit there declaring that he is God. Verse number 5, listen carefully. 
Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness, which is the lawless rebellion against God and his Christ against the word of God, the Bible says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Critical expression, I'll explain it. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And some translations have it. Why he and it? I'm going to tell you something. If I were to take a swimming pool and I were to fill it with 10,000 gallons of water and I would put in it 20 gallons of chlorine, the presence of that 20 gallons of chlorine has an effect on the entire pool. Something is removed, and when it is removed, he at the same time, in some kind of power, is removed. Someone says, the Holy Spirit is removed and can't be during the tribulation. Here, during the tribulation. Well, then I have one question to ask. How can anyone be saved? Because the Holy Spirit's the one that brings people to Christ. Here's what I think the text is telling us. When the church is removed, the church is like a restraining power holding Satan back. We aren't holding him back. God in the church is holding him back. But when you remove millions of Christians from the earth, the greatest restraint to Satan taking over this world is removed. And that is what this is referring to. When the church is gone, hell is going to break loose. And that is going to be when the Antichrist comes to power and ultimately he will be destroyed. Look, if you will, at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and I'll finish this passage and then take any questions. For the mystery of lawlessness, this underlying secretive agenda of rebellion is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until it is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And that's Revelation chapter 19 if you want to write it in your Bibles. When Jesus returns in His glory, He will simply, by speaking, send Him, consent, send him, consign Him to hell. Now, I didn't intend to make you experts on prophecy, but are there any questions before we break? You're not overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. But see, what I don't want you to do is leave with something that's gnawing at you. All right, Diane, you have a question. You said uh, Satan is uh, sent to hell. Yes. Is he not loose in the trip? I mean, it loose in the millennium? No. No. Okay. Now I'll answer a question. Is Satan not loose in the millennium? No. Now I'm going to show you something. Okay. This is important. Remember? People came out of the tribulation period who were saved and they had their natural bodies. They had children and grandchildren. And for a thousand years, Christ, with every Old Testament saint, every church age saint, every tribulation saint, and all of the angels rules the earth. And after a thousand years, Revelation chapter 20, if you want to write this passage down. Revelation 20, Satan is loosed at the end. And you say, why? I'm going to tell you why. There's an important reason why. Logically thinking, we just would logically think, if I could talk with Adam, and I could talk with Moses, and I could talk with David, and I could talk with Paul, and I could talk with all of the Christians in the church age, and people who went through the tribulation period, surely I would believe in Jesus Christ. I would trust Him as Savior. And the answer is, not necessarily. 
Man's problem has never been his environment. Man's problem is his heart. The heart of man is anti-God. Babies are born and we talk about an innocent baby and you think that a baby was an angel. But all it takes is a little bit of time and that little baby can turn into a little demon because man is born a sinner. And all man needs is an opportunity. And the purpose of releasing Satan is to show all of the world and all of the angels that in the best circumstances, just like Adam, humanity will turn against Jesus Christ. Not necessarily the volume. We don't know the volume. We just know that there will be a move. And that's in Revelation 20. Clearly stated, Revelation 20. So the purpose of Satan being released is to prove to us and to the heavenly angels, once again, man will rebel, given the opportunity. See, we often blame Adam. I see notes on, on Facebook and I say to myself, they are so ignorant. Adam was not the problem. You were in Adam. You just don't understand that. You contributed to Adam's decision. And the proof at the end is to show that, forget Adam, man is a rebel. Any other questions? I'm glad we have covered the whole Bible today. <laughs> um, you did send an email out, which I intend to respond to. You were asking us about thoughts for... Paul? One. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry I haven't responded to you yet. It's okay, a lot of people haven't. Okay. Um, the cards are for you yes. to tell people next year that you'd like them to join us. Yes. Now, they are not about this class, but there are cards with my information. And if you have a preference about what you want to study, let us know. My wife says, would you pray? And I will pray so we can draw this to a close. Father, thank you so much for the fact that we have hope, security, and peace ahead of us. This turmoil which has gone on for so long in our lives and distressed us, it will disappear into oblivion, just like dust in the air when we are with Christ in eternity. And help us to remember what we're going through is temporary. What we're looking to is eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.